Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. This is a bit of a surprise, isn't it? That we could all be together again so soon. Yeah, I thank the Lord for that. And I love this place. I love you people. We had a great time last time. It was just so, so good to have met you all. Take back a good report to New Zealand. And uh, everyone wants to come now. <laughs> so I guarantee that if uh, there's another convention or gathering of some type, that uh, you're going to have to put up with a few more of us from New Zealand Amen. because <laughs> everyone wants to come. So anyways, thank you for making us feel so welcome. Yeah, really something very special going on here. You may be seated. I would just like to greet you all by name and uh, guarantee I'm going to leave somebody out. So praise the Lord. We all get to have a little talk together later. But, uh, I would like to talk this evening about the glorified body. And uh, while I've called it perfect body, and we've heard so much about that over the last five, seven years, and first time I heard that uh, we are immortal, that we don't have to die to be resurrected, and all these things that have come from this place, from this church, from your pastor, Amen. it challenged us greatly, it changed us, it transformed our lives. We are, well, you know, we can hardly express, for lack of words, the appreciation Amen. to our Lord Jesus Amen. for what he has done th through the ministry that God has given us. And uh, I, it's a privilege to be preaching with Brother Don. He puts up with me. Um, he looks after me, actually. Takes good care of me. And I'm sure he turns a blind eye sometimes, Sister Patty. You know, good, a good brother to be around. I, I uh, thank God that I'm able to be a part of the ministry. A small part, I'll help where I can. And uh, where, where I know my limits, just stand aside when I have to. But I just feel so welcome, I'm so thankful to God, and I just wanted to express my joy. Uh, the people back home send their love, Sister Rose, she really loved, she had a great time, her and Amber, they just, you know, didn't stop talking about you, haven't stopped actually. All the photos come out, share it with the next one, the next one that comes to the house, you know, just, uh, they had a great time, so they couldn't make it this time, obviously. I've got with me a precious brother, you would have heard about him, Brother Robbie must have spread the news about Dave. His eating buddy. That's what he calls him, Brother Robbie. And uh, I'm, I want Brother Dave just to say hello to you if it's all right. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure you'd love to hear yes. him say yes. greetings. So, Brother Dave, come on up here, brother. He's an old friend of mine, good friend. He looks after me real well. So this is Brother David Arnst. Ete uh, rangatira, Brother Don. Ete minute. Brother Jerry, uh, e Fanu uh, whanu, whanui, a lighthouse, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Uh, <coughs> ka i koutou, uh, ka hui hui mai nei e tēnā wā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, and uh, God bless you, Brother, uh, brother Don. Indian Chief and Brother Jerry, Lighthouse Fellowship, our extended family. God bless you. Greetings. Uh, just greetings to all of us who are gathered here at this time. I just count it um, such a privilege to come and stand with you together and worship the Lord to be here in um, USA. And uh, Brother Jerry, we had a, a real nice time uh, last night traveling back from the airport and uh, I said to Brother Jerry, I said, Brother Jerry, don't underestimate the, uh, the ministry the Lord's given you. It, you know, I've heard one or two little messages from Brother Jerry and they've been such a blessing and such a strength uh, to me. And uh, so I said to him, don't underestimate what God's given you uh, because we're a body and we all have a different part to play and uh, it's really important that we understand that God's called us all together as many members of this body to work together. Amen. And um, I really appreciate uh, Brother Don. He's just been such a strength to us. Um, I've been around the message of Brother Branham for a little while. And 
One thing I've come to realise with the word as it's unfolded to us, and, and we use that term, third coming, but whatever way you want to express it, with the way the word's opened is that uh, everything that we thought we knew, we didn't know anything. <laughs> up, you know, Brother Bram said the way up is down. Well, that's exactly how it is in this word. The way what we thought was up is down, what we thought down was is up. And it's all back to front and inside out and every which way except what we thought it was. And, um, and one more thing that I could just say that, uh, to express that is that, you know, we used to think that we were an earthly being trying to struggle through some sort of spiritual experience yes. on this earth. And then we come to find out that we're actually spiritual beings passing through this earth having an earthly experience. And that one truth has, for me personally, done so much for my experience and my walk with the Lord than, than maybe anything else. It's, to me, just a real key, a real foundation Amen. to this word and to be able to just understand who we are, what we're doing here, where we're going, and everything that's happening around us. That truth is just, for me, a real, a real anchor, a real cornerstone. So... Um, and I feel really humbled and I'm really privileged to be with you all and to be able to be with Brother Don and Brother Mitter and Brother Joe when, um, when we head off to Haiti. It's um, not something I thought would ever happen. Every time uh, I've been overseas, I think, oh, well, this is the last trip. <laughs> and somehow the Lord just knocks on the door and says, one more time. So, so I'm really looking forward to just being able to be a support and just to help to the ministry. And that's my, always been my desire, as I, I don't desire for a ministry to stand up there and preach the word, but I just desire to be a support to those people that are carrying the ball, you know. There's nothing worse than having your teammates trying to drag that ball off you when you're running for the goal line. Far better to be standing beside them there, giving them all the support that, that you can, that they can make it to the goal line and score. So that's what's in my heart is just to be a support in whatever little way I can uh, for the ministry. So, um, and I'd just like to, um, just like to finish with um, a little um, proverb that our native people have. And it's, Mate mahitahi ka oti pai te kopapa. And that means as we work together, the job is well done. And so I believe that's what we'll see when we go to Haiti as we work together in the name of the Lord, we'll see a job that is well done. Amen. Amen. So thank you and God bless you all. Amen. Appreciate being with you. Brother David was speaking in the Maori language and, and bringing you a greeting. It's good. I can pick this up, can't I? Okay. Yeah, I think I'd better walk. <laughs> if you also need to walk, don't worry. Just relax and just jump up if you have to. Get a bit of fresh air. But just whatever you do, don't keel over in the pew and uh, fall to sleep. But brother, brother David will tap you on the shoulder. Anyways, we'll do our best to keep you awake. It'll be my fault if you go to sleep. I've only got myself to blame. So here we go. We're going to preach the Word of God tonight. And we've entitled this message Perfect Body. We're not talking about athletics, you know, body like Arnold Schwarzenegger or what. We're talking about... No, we're not talking about that kind of perfect body. We're talking about new creation. Amen. And, uh, well, of course, we've all looked forward to a body change. Now, the ministry has told us we have a body change. We have a new body, and it's a perfect body. But uh, if we're any, any bit intellectual, that we will conflict in our intellect with that. Many people do, because when we look at ourselves, we have all these little faults and failings. And uh, just as we get started, uh, well, before I came here, I was preaching on the subject, and then I grabbed a hold of Brother Don's notes that what he had been preaching here the last two services and I thought, my goodness, I'm not going to have anything to preach. I thought, I thought that's what I was going to preach. And while well, he preached it already, so I thought, well, Lord, I'm just going to join right in and get beside him. And uh, so we're talking about perfection. That's what we're talking about. And as I said, uh, you would get a conflict in yourself. I was telling our people back home, you know, it's, uh, here we are saying we've had a body change. We have a perfect body already. And one simple example, if, 
I could just leave this example with you as, we, as, we, as a foundation that Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. So he, he had to believe against everything that he was. He had to go against everything that he believed he was. In fact, what the Bible tells us, his body was dead, his wife's body was dead, so he was of, uh, of an age that had passed having children, and God said, you are going to have a son, and Sarah shall conceive and bring forth. We all know the story. Could you imagine what was going through that man's mind, or especially his wife? The Bible made it so clear of what she thought about that promise. The promise was too much for her intellect. She looked at herself, her body failing for age, and here was the promise of God's word telling her that you're going to have a new body, that I am giving you a new body in order to conceive and bring forth a child. She just laughed at God, didn't she? I guess that's uh, the way a lot of people are about our preaching, about our word. They'll just sit there and laugh. You can't blame them. Uh, it's so opposite. And that was so opposite that day in Genesis when God said that to Abraham. Abraham had to believe God. And, you know, we, we know the consequence of him not believing God. 25 years later, he was in trouble, you know, toiling and struggling and laboring with what God had told him, that, you know, though his body were dead, in other words, yet shall you live, you shall have a son. Yes. Now, what if we said that to somebody of the same age in this, in this neighborhood? They would have the same reaction, no doubt. The good thing about Abraham, Abraham believed God's word no matter what. No matter how impossible it looked, the circumstances, he still felt the wrinkles on his face, you know, you might question and say, well, actually, his face straightened out. And he looked brand new, and his, his jaw was nice and square. His skin wasn't flabby anymore. His pot had left him. You could say that. That's all right. I'm not, I'm not going to say that didn't happen. But I know one thing. He died of old age. He died, of, he, he died and his wife died in sickness. But yet the Bible says God gave her a new body and proved it when she brought forth a son. And yet this new body that was given by God had still suffered, had still gone on, had lived a, a normal, everyday, natural life. Right. See, so that's the body we're dealing with. Right. Though it be a new body, God give it to us and he said it's perfect. We have to believe God's word by faith the same way our father Abraham had to believe God. Right. Amen? So what are we believing? We believe in the word of God, obviously. And uh, the word that came by a great prophet... Malachi, the prophet of Revelation 10, William Branham, he says in the future home here, he said, Adam and Eve here on the earth and said, multiply now and replenish the earth. William Branham is quoting the scripture. He says their bodies was, now this is an unusual statement. I used it here last time I was here. I've heard Brother Don, many preachers use it. Look at the statement here of a, of a prophet. Their bodies was all laid out here for you to eat and make your body. Now, can anybody make... Uh, intellectual sense of that you know you've got to understand this is a prophet speaking under inspiration and he's not governed by grammar there's no limitations on on the word of God coming by the way of a prophet so he's under inspiration here and you know when a prophet speaks it's not that he would God would leave us in the dark so that we don't have a clue what he's saying there's always comes a season for us to pick up and understand these unusual statements made by God's servants you know it might take us a little while but after a little bit, God will always have somebody on the earth to pick up that hidden element and break it and make it plain to the people. And I believe that's what God is doing right now. Taking these unusual things, these uh, out-of-the-way statements that are intellectually challenging to us. And then through the ministry that God has given us now, making it so plain. Like Jesus, when he walked with the two men to Emmaus, we know the way that he opened the Bible. And then the scripture says he came back and opened their understanding. Is that right? So the second part of the ministry, and that's what we are, we all, we all are familiar with it, that's where we are right now, that our Lord Jesus, he came through William Branham, and he opened truths to us, scriptures to us, yes. amen, the book of Revelation, book of Daniel, book of Genesis, he opened scriptures to us, but just the same way uh, as it was, two men walking to Emmaus, he's come back again, but this time to open our understanding. You know the Bible says that when their eyes were opened, they knew him. Amen. Uh, they, they, they felt the presence. They felt the inspiration. They felt the joy. They felt the zeal. They felt the atmosphere, the victory. They felt something about his presence when Jesus walked with them along the way. Amen. 
But you know, it's, it's not enough for us to have a good feeling. It's nice to enjoy the services, enjoy the ministry, enjoy what, the gatherings. But I believe that God don't want to leave us in the dark. He's here to give us an understanding. You say, well, I don't know much. Well, you don't have to know much. We're not talking about knowing at all. Right. We're not talking about that. But I am saying one thing. God is here to give us an understanding of those hidden things. And here's one statement. It sat there for many years. Uh, a prophet under that inspiration telling us their bodies, talking about Adam and Eve, their bodies was all laid out here for you to eat and make your body. That's the way he had of doing it. Very, very, very unusual statement. Their bodies was all laid out here. Well, we, we, we want to make it simple. Of course, we came like Adam, Genesis 2, 7. Adam was given a body that was formed out of the dust of the ground. Before that, the man, Adam, was a theophany uh, without flesh. Genesis 1, 26, 27. Amen. There was Adam, the man, standing in his theophany body. Perfect already. Didn't need any improvements except it had needs to come this way for the experience. And then God takes him in Genesis 2, 7 and puts clay on him. We know the old story. And out he comes. He wasn't supposed to bring forth children by sex. Amen. Not exactly. But God allowed it to happen that way for a purpose, to fulfill his purpose. Amen. But here we see that God had said to Adam and Eve, multiply and replenish the earth and bring forth. And it was supposed to be by the creative power of the spoken word. Speak like God. Let there be and there was light. Let there be and there was the ocean. Let the earth and there, there it was the earth. Let there be, let there be. The spoken word is what God used to create this universe. Isn't that right? So Adam and Eve were given that opportunity to speak and create. But they took another route. And through sex program, through biological engineering, by bringing male and female chemistry together, they brought forth children. Yes. Amen. Well, we know that wasn't a mistake, but that wasn't the original plan and purpose, was to create children that way. Anyways, we'll go on. That's enough of that. Uh, a perfect body is a glorified body. And I, I like the fact that theophany has come and taken over my earth. Amen. I, I just am amazed at that statement that we are immortal. Well, I've recently come to understand it, so I guess that's why I'm standing here preaching it partly for myself. And Jesus, let's go to Jesus talking about this body because we're talking about a glorified body. Like I said, it's not talking about a six pack and everything else. We're talking about a supernatural body. And that, you know, you might have a pot, but that's a perfect body. If God said it, he said it, I believe it. I'm not going to wrestle with it like Abraham. I just believe it, brother boss. Amen. And I'm going to be like that blind man in the barber chair who was blind as a bat. And God's prophet said, you got your eyes, you're healed. Jesus Christ makes you well. He went down to that place and he made a racket. He, he got to preaching to that barber. He said, I am healed. I've got eyes. I can see. I'm healed. I'm healed. Poor, poor barber there. You know, you could imagine looking at this blind fella. He would have thought that that preacher got him hysterical. Well, what's that preacher doing up that church? Got him all worked up, yeah. making all these strange confessions. And look at his eyes. that no better than ever they were. But that man, nonetheless, pressed through. He shook off the shame, the embarrassment. He didn't care less what. He believed now what the prophet of God said about his body. And he made a confession. And then after he believed and made his confession, we know the story. Out from that barber chair, he came half-shaved. His eyes popped open for the first time in his life, and he started running down that street screaming. Well, you see, like those simple examples you've all read over the, all the years in this message, well, let's apply it to this subject of created bodies, of glorified bodies. Just take those simple little stories and apply them. The story of Abraham, the story of the blind man who believed what God's Word said about his body despite the condition he was in. Right. Amen? Hallelujah. That's faith. That's what it is. It's a revelation. Faith is not just hoping. Oh, I hope, hope the preacher's right. Well, if the Word of God said it, it's got to be right. Amen. We're not just hoping so, but the Word of God declared us to be glorified right now. Amen. Jesus said, O oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, Glorified, illuminated, uh, immortal, if you like, glorified. 
is something more beyond carnal, supernatural, glorified body. Uh, having value added. That's what glorification is. Something more than those fillings in your mouth. You've got something added to you that's beyond the fillings that you look at and you wish you had your old pearlers like you used to when you were 18. Look at them. You know, we're, we're talking about an improvement. Now, you might not think this is an improvement, Brother Bosch, but you're looking pretty good to me. We we'll look at each other. Don't look like any improvements. Glorified is an improvement. It's an advancement. It's an unfolding evolution. You know, Prophet of God talks about spiritual evolution. So we came from a certain place. We all know that. And then we come on down into this earth now. That's where we thought we got ourselves in trouble. And we would always preach that coming into this earth is the last thing I ever, I didn't ask to be born. You know that old statement? Oh, you know, I didn't ask to be born. You'd tell your father or something. You know, when you're in trouble and you've got all this genetic uh, complaints and going through some hormonal changes, 13 years old, testosterone and everything else. So you blame your father. I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> Try to fob it off to that. It's your fault, in other words. And we thought, while well, coming into here was, was, was a trouble. But really, by the word of God, we come to realize that this is an improvement. Right. You say, oh, if I was only in heaven. You don't have to die to be in heaven. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's one thing about this revelation. You don't have to die to go there. But, but yet we've been taught that glorification is something in the future. That's what we always were taught. You know, one day, one day, one day we're going to heaven. One day we're going to attain to this perfect body. One day we're going to be glorified. Well, Jesus said here, you know, Glor glorify thou me. Now he's talking future tense. He's, he's asking the Father to glorify him in a future tense. Watch this now, in case you people think this is it, and you fellas, you know, we don't, we don't want to leave you on this earth looking like this. Even though I say this is improvement. You know, there's more to come. There is more to come. You say, are you, are you brothers just preaching that this is it? And the world will just go on and go on, and, you know, we just thank God we've got pop bellies, but we're perfect. Oh, no. There's more to come. Oh, don't you worry about that. But what we are saying is let's enjoy what we have here and now. Let's make use of it, let's make good of it, and let's enjoy it. Because we're constantly conflicting in our minds about our age and everything else. Now Jesus did look for a future. He said, glorify thou me. So that's future. With thine own self, with the glory which I had. So that's past. So let's not say that we never had something. We did. We had it. Let's not say that we haven't got it already. Because Jesus said here, I am glorified. Amen. What I'm trying to show you here is, he which was which is, which is to come. The whole thing is glorification. Amen. That's what I'm saying. Glorify thou me with the glory I had. Take me back to that condition without flesh and blood. Jesus was in that condition without flesh and blood. That's what he's saying. Glorify thou me. Take me there. Take me further. Or, or in other words, take me back to that condition that I don't have to wear a flesh body anymore. Glorify thou me. That's future. Which I had. That's past. And then I, I, just, I just love this statement here in verse 10. I am glorified in them. Amen. We don't have to go nowhere to be glorified. That's, right. that's my point. Amen. We don't have to look back to something we may have had or look forward or look at, look at something we may be missing. No, no. Past, present, and future. Right. He which was, which is, which is to come. Amen. Amen. So let's go on. John 6, 33. Uh, Jesus for the, speaking, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, if I've written a little note there just to prompt me, a thought is Revelation 10 and 1 Thessalonians 4. We're in the time that we've come through a rapture. Uh, the Bible said in Revelation 10, I saw another mighty angel descend from heaven. An, an angel clothed with the sun. Uh, his face shone as the sun. He descended from heaven. I saw another angel, John said. I saw a mighty angel. Amen. He would always say it like that. I saw another angel. Or I saw a mighty angel. You know, we always think about that as being Jesus. But I believe this is a perpetual unfolding since Adam. Yeah. Amen. I saw another angel. 
His name was Joseph. I saw another angel. His name was David. I, I, I saw another angel. You know, when John was looking, I believe, he was looking through the eyes of eternity and watching the process unfold. I saw another angel descend from heaven. There's always an angel in the Bible coming from heaven. Jesus said, from henceforth you shall see angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. Is that right? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I saw a mighty angel descending from heaven. Now let's apply that to ourselves tonight. We've done a long time putting that on Jesus. Put a face on Him, that's my Lord. But what about you? Are you in that scripture? Can you say of yourself, Revelation 10, when I look at uh, Jerry Allen, our precious brother, I, John looked, I saw another angel coming down from heaven with a book in his hand, with a book open. What was that? A ready to unfold a life in earth. Amen. A little book, a life to live, coming from a celestial realm into a terrestrial realm. Amen. That's what that little scripture is talking about. Another angel, a celestial body with a book open, ready to un- evolve into a, a earthly experience. That's what it's saying. But let's watch the scripture and apply it to ourselves. Let's not just leave that for Jesus. Amen. You know, people say, oh, yeah, everything's possible to my God. My God can do anything. We sing that song, my God can do anything. But you know what? The Bible doesn't say that exactly. It said all things are possible to God and to him that believes. That's right. Amen. So let's not just leave it all on God. Amen. Amen. He said, and him that believes all things are possible, not only to God. So let's think about that principle when Jesus is calling himself the bread that comes down from heaven. Oh, I'm not going to leave that experience just only for Jesus because Brother Branham said he was the first of a new race. And if he was the first of a new race, that means there's others like him that have come in the field since. So everything he said, everything he was, he poured into us. So let's think about that when we're reading about Jesus here. He said, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Hallelujah. What world are we talking about? We have a picture of a a Jesus born in a manger. We have a little picture in our head about a Christ who grew up and died at Calvary. We have a picture in our minds and we think about this bread that came down from heaven and gave life unto the world. We think about our precious Savior with uh, nail scars in his hand and we ought to. But what is that all about? God, Jesus was just showing us the order by which we would come. Amen. That where we came from, like he says, I, I, I am the bread that came down from heaven. We didn't come. I tell my people back home, I didn't come from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I wasn't, I wasn't born of Gurley and Leo Edwardson. That's right. William Branham dawned on him, struck him. You remember what he said? I, I realized I was not the son of Charles and Ella Branham. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, Mary come along and say, you know, where have you been, boy? Twelve years old in the temple. You know that me and your father have been looking for you? He, she, he says, don't you know that I should be about my father's business? It kind of seemed like a cheeky thing for a boy to say. Like, i got another father, and I've been about his business. But he had a revelation. He had the revelation that we're picking up on, and this is not just some new thing that sprouted out of some invention from the top of somebody's mind who had too much steak to eat. This is an old-time gospel. This is just old-fashioned. As we go through the Scriptures, all the Scriptures speak about the third coming and us being glorified and not having to die to be resurrected. Every old-fashioned scripture talks about it. This is not just a new thing that's popped out. Well, here, let's go on. Let's just think about that. Giving life unto the world. I had a chunk of world that was born in New Zealand. That's not the real me. And I am the theophany bread that came down to take that world and give life unto it. I kept it from being squashed by a motor car. I kept it from being murdered. I kept it all along the way from dying from drug overdoses. I kept that body, the bread that came down from heaven, gave life unto that world until it destroyed it completely. It held that thing. It nurtured it. It protected it for a given season. 
Look at that scripture again. He says, He which cometh down from heaven is the bread of God and giveth life unto the world. We're not just talking about a Jesus with a couple of nail scars who died for the entire globe. We're not talking about that. In fact, he didn't die for the whole. We're just talking about the order of Melchizedek. I'm talking about the new birth here. That's what we're talking about. John 6.35, And Jesus said unto them, He, gets, he sharpens it up. He says, I am the bread of life. Amen. Amen. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Now it seems presumptuous. Could you, could you blame those people for thinking that he was a little bit crazy? You couldn't blame them really. Spiritual things are supernaturally discerned. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Here's the part. Look at the congregation. Look at all the people, the religious people of that day concerning his teaching. Look at his teaching, what it was. I am the bread that come down from heaven. I was already glorified. I am glorified. And I'm going on to glorification. What kind of a teaching is this? Look at the response of the people to the doctrine. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. What, what about you when you say, oh, I was in that mystery cloud. I was there in 63. I came on down. That's what I'm doing here. Amen. Well, look at the response of the people, even to this teaching. Yes. Is it any different than that? Yes. Is it any different? It's no different. When you start to speak the same language, teach the same things, that's all we're doing. I say, why don't you preach the old gospel? That's what we're doing, John chapter 6, the gospel of St. John. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph. It's not this the boy from Kentucky. Isn't this this fellow that we grew up with, played, played marbles with? Whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? This kind of teaching was too much. This fellow, they knew his location. They knew his mother and father, natural. And this congregation was supposed to be spiritual people. Our people around the message, Malachi 4, are supposed to be the cream of the crop. You know, we can preach the indictment different now. They're the most holy place. They, the most holy people, crucified Him, the most holy God. Why did they, the most holy people, crucify Him? Because of this teaching of where He come from. About the teaching of glorification. The glorified body that He was declaring to them. See what I'm saying? It's no different today. Look at the response there. Now, Brother Branham led us in church age. We know this quote very well. Brother Don's used it over the years. He stands there revealing who he is in this last age. Brother Branham speaking, he calls himself the author of the creation of God. This is another creation. This has to do with the church. Hello, somebody wake up. This is not to do with the Jesus of 2,000 years ago Amen. with some pinpricks in his hand. Brother Branham here is talking about another creation. This has to do with the church. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're shifting it from Jesus. Now we're shifting it into the people. Amen. That the self-same experience of the bread that came down, where he came from, what he was doing there, how he declared he was glorified, and how the people reacted to that. Look at this, Brother Branham is saying, concerning Jesus, he was the author of the creation of God. This is another creation. Then he goes on to say, this has to do with the church. This is a special designation of himself. He is the creator of that church. The heavenly bridegroom created his own bride. We're going to talk about that a little bit here. He goes on. Of him it was said, Lo, a body hast thou, Father, prepared for me. God, not Mary, provided that body. He said, oh, I, know, I know my mama. I know her name. I grew up with her. She's my mother. No, it's not exactly. She ain't your mother no more. In fact, you had another mother. She was an incubator. In, in real terms. Our mothers are our incubators. Amen. Amen. Over him it was said, Lower body hast thou father prepared for me. God, not Mary, provided that body. Right. You know what our mother prepared for us? She prepared us a body with all kinds of complaints. She ate too much ice cream when she was carrying us. She, she drank too much soda pop. And that's why we came out with acne. 
We got all these genetic disorders. That's the body she gave you. But the body I'm talking about is perfect and it's not that one. Amen. Amen. You got what I'm saying. He was the first. And he goes on, Brother Branham. He was of the new creation. Man and God met and joined. He was the first of this new race. He is the head of this new race. Now, when you think about it, how could Jesus be the first of this order? Seeing as Adam, back in Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 2, 7. I, I thought that, you know, there was others like him before him. Adam was, Jesus was Adam. You know, the new race, we already had an old race, and that one passed away 4,000 years of Old Testament ages. 4,000 years of law and bondage had just passed away. Is that right? The Bible says that Jesus came at the end of the world. What world ended? Amen. What world ended at the fullness of time right. when God sent his son? It was 4,000 years of a character, of a nature that came by way of a certain teaching. A character that was embedded in the people due to the things that they were taught. They acted according to the way they, was, they were learning. God just wiped that away and brought in a new covenant. And Jesus was the first of this new race. Yes. Yes. And then 2,000 years, a prophet of God tells us the Holy Ghost was bound 2,000 years by denominational rivers. And we saw 2,000 years, there was a certain order different than the Old Testament. We call it the New Testament. Amen, you don't have to kill lambs no more. You don't have to, don't have to get round up cows, get little birds, take their heads off, sprinkle blood on buildings. It was all finished through the blood of our Lord Jesus. 2,000 years of living free from the old order. But now here comes the prophet and says, Shalom, good morning. It is the rising of the sun. A brand new day is breaking. Between mortal and immortal. So what was happening right there? Another creation. Yes. There were a, a one, another world was ending. Amen. Bible tells us in Ephesians that he shall send Jesus Christ in the fullness of times. Revelation 10, 6, when time is no longer. Amen. So Revelation 10 is Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 is what? That in the fullness of time he shall gather together all things, both which is in heaven and earth. There was a great gathering together in Ephesians 1.10, fulfilling Revelation 10, verse 6. What is Revelation 10, verse 6? That time shall be no longer. No longer for what? No more time for the old order, for the old creation. Time is up for that other book. So what have we got now? We've got a third creation, haven't we? I don't know what Brother Don's going to do with me after the service. But I'm going to say this. That William Branham was the first of that new race. Right. William Branham was the first of the new creation. Right. Son of the morning. Amen. The first one to come to maturity. Amen. Amen. But you know what? When there's one, there's more to come. In the wave sheaf offering in the Old Testament, what was the celebration of the sheaf waving? It was in the time of harvest, the very first mature grain that they saw they would cut it and lift it up like our prophet was and waved before the people. William Branham was taken and caught up in a mystery cloud. Hallelujah. And our Lord waved him before us, signifying that there was more coming just like him. He was the son of the new day. He was the beginning of the creation of God. And there were other sons to multiply after him. Do you understand me? I'm sure you do. He was the first of this new race, Jesus. He is the head of this new race. Let's go on. Revelation tells us. Now we're talking about wedding supper here. Let's talk about that supper for a minute. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Amen. You remember what Jesus said? I am the bread. You eat my... He that cometh to me and eats this bread, you'll never hunger again. And now he's switching it. It's not that he keeps that for himself. I solely am, a, a, am the super royal seed. He wants to multiply this thing. Yes. So he says, I will come into him and will sup with him 
and he with me. Now he's going to share this life in the new creation. I'll show you what I'm saying. Eating flesh is the act of sowing seed for the sake of bringing a child to birth. Like when, you know, Adam and Eve ate in the Garden of Eden. Talking about eating as an act of bringing children. Here in Revelation 3, Christ is saying, If any man opens his heart, I will come into him and we will sup together. Amen. Now if somebody comes into you and sups with you, you're going to bring forth something. Amen. You're going to bring to birth and fulfill Revelation chapter 12. Amen. A son is born in Revelation 12. Here's a woman in travail. What for? To bring forth a new body. Amen. Hallelujah. The prophet of God said the seed comes through the body. It has to be a ministry on earth where that seed will travel through. We say, well, why, why do we have to go and preach? Why, you know, God's children will just come to the truth. God has always used man. He doesn't use clouds. He doesn't speak to people through rivers. He can do by nature, but God always used man to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. What I'm saying now, now, the seed must come through the body. There has to be somebody here to declare the word, the spirit spoken word of the season, in order to pregnate you and quicken you and bring you to a new birth. Amen. Well, an example of that is Ezekiel. We're talking about a perfect body here. And I'm tell we're telling you, and I'm telling you tonight, and joining with my brother, that this very body, no matter how old it is, I don't care what shape it is and how many kgs, pounds or whatever you say here how many pounds it is the word of God is telling us we got a new brand new race we have a brand new uh, gospel we're in a new world now Amen. old things have passed away look at that scripture there all things are become new can you believe that Amen. what is that scripture talking about if any man be in Christ Revelation 3 yes. if any man be in Christ the word of the hour all things have passed away there it is Amen. that's that old creation that's that one that your mama bought with pimples and all that hormonal problems and all those breakouts of troubles. You say, well, I got heart, heart troubles because of my father. This is one thing I want to undo. If anything, I, if anything, my purpose and objective is to undo that mentality of thinking you have to inherit anything from your pappy. There's only one pappy that you inherit from. That's the word of God. That's your theophany. You inherit in your body the things that come from your father, the theophany, that created you, that birthed you, that walks with you, that's one with you. You inherit from him Amen. the promises that he has for you of healing and victory and joy Amen. and life more abundantly. Yes. He said, but how is it? Because, you know, I look like my dad, everything else. You know, the Bible said about Jesus, he, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Likeness is not sinful flesh. He looked like the rest of them. He looked like a beast like every other person, like Caiaphas and everyone else. He had features like a man. But the Bible says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But that what didn't make him sinful flesh. He was only in the likeness. What about us being born again? We look like everybody else. We look like Joe Bloggs at our job. You know, we look like the bus driver. We all have nostrils like him. We have teeth. We have ears like him. But you know what that Bible says? We are only in the likeness, Sim similar in feature, but completely different in our, in our system. And the systems by which we live are completely different. We are governed by another universe. I'm talking about inheriting. The Bible says the sins of the father shall be visited upon the children. So everybody says, Amen. We can't deny the word. Well, that was from the old order. That was from the old book. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Amen. The Bible says that one day it shall be said that everyone will be accountable for himself. In other words, you will no, it will no longer be said, I got this because of my father. He ate too much, whatever it was. Or drank so much of this. And he had gout, and so i got to have gout. Heart, all, you know, I'll tell you something. All of my people, they died at 50-something years old. And I'm coming up for a death if I believe in if I believe in the natural biological genetics, what my, you know, first thing the doctor says, anyone in your family got that? Does your father have it? Mother, trouble in the family? You know, you have to take a long time to explain. <laughs> I 
Of course, the answer is no way. Absolutely no. But you see, you see well, like I said, my uncles, they all died like drop dead, you know, cancer and heart attacks before they even fulfilled their lives. Every one of them died, including my grandfather. Never knew him. It's, it's like 52 is just too young to die. One of them was 48. And a whole list of them, I can just go through the list of all my uncles and that, they just dropped dead. So it seems now that if I want to, I can welcome that into my spirit and believe some old order, but I choose rather to believe that this body here, by the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, has cancelled all of that bad genetics out of my system. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Now that's a message for the doctor. I know Brother Don's already given his doctor that headache. That's complicated for them. Here's the scripture. It says here in Hebrews 10, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, phasing out the old order, but a body hast thou prepared me. Don't give me a bunch of rules. Don't give me a bunch of, uh, you know, antidotes. You know, stick a plaster and stick it on a saw and hope it goes away. Don't get to the bottom of it. No, don't give me all that sacrifice and all that. Give me a body. That's what Hebrews says. A body hast thou prepared me. This body, this new body we have has been in preparation a long while. John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Watch what I was saying before. This birth is dependent on an individual. Ezekiel was my example. I was trying to tell you before. God comes to Ezekiel and says, What do you think about this dead bunch? Do you think you can do anything with these people? Ezekiel standing there. He says, Ah, you know, you know all about it, Lord. Thou knowest it. He says, Son of man, just have a word to them. Just have a word to them. Prophesy unto these bones, son of man. Now look, now that's not prophesying to some, you know, some way out something. He's talking specifically about sinews and flesh and bones. I'm talking about a new body. I'm talking about a blood system that's been recreated, redesigned. The old fellow is completely washed. You don't have to claim all that genetic disease no more. That, that's not even coping with the word. The word of God said we have a perfect body now. All that is canceled out. We're in a new day. All old things have passed away. All things have become new. So what are you going to believe? Amen. What are we going to believe? Amen. I want to believe the word of God. But here now, uh, just like Ezekiel, he was the one that prepared Israel to bring them into their birth. He was told specifically, preach to these bones, prophesy to their flesh. What did Ezekiel say? Well, I saw a bunch of bones. They had, they had a shake in time. They all gathered together. Ankle bones came to the shin bone. He said, I saw flesh and sinews. There was a, then it became a great army. Yes. What was happening right there? Look at that. This individual right here, Ezekiel, was responsible for Israel's birth into a new book. Amen. He took them from the old temple to the new temple in his preaching. It took a man to do that. You know what I'm saying? Let's place some value on the ministries that God has given us. Amen. And the words that come by their mouths. Amen. Because their voice is creative power. Amen. And not just leave it there, but once it connects in your heart, then you go and tell your children. Now you become that now. You become Ezekiel with the, with the anointing and inspiration and the creative voice to multiply, to create others in the likeness of yourself. Amen. I go to prepare a place. That's my point here. Jesus knew he had to go away. And I go to prepare a place for you. It wasn't just for him. It was for others. Amen. The body was for others. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, that ye may be also. He wanted to share that experience. Every preacher wants to share this experience with his congregation. Every mother, good mother, wants to share this experience with their children. Well, look at this. You have the power, and not only the power, you have the commission. Ezekiel was commissioned. Ezekiel, he thought it was enough. He changed that physical body and the dry bones, and what was the next thing? Prophesy unto the wind, son of man. He changed the flesh and blood system 
and he changed the human spirit to another spirit. Instead of cussing and swearing and ag- aggro and agitated and malice and all kinds of cheap tricks that comes from that animalistic nature, here's one individual responsible under commission and under inspiration to change this whole body. He changed the metabolism of that body, the physics of it, the chemistry of it. He dealt with the elements of the earth and brought flesh together. Then he dealt with the spirit. He said, prophesy to the wind, son of man. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Here's the commission to Haiti. Here's the commission to Gabon. Here's the commission that's sweeping the earth from this place. What is it? It's the commission of Ezekiel. What to do? To change physical bodies. To bring them into a birth. To show them that they have the power. That they can live. Not under their privileges. But live in victory. Live in joy. Live in comfort. Under, under the word of God for the hour. That's what Ezekiel did to those dry bones. Do you think that was very comfortable for them? All disconnected, scattered in open valleys. But it was at the preaching of this one individual to bring them all together and put new bodies on them. You say, well, what about you? What do you mean new bodies? Well, if you've got a bunch of bones out there, they used to have a body once. Those dry bones had a body that belonged to them at one stage. We had a body that we came by our mammy and pappy. It belonged to us once. But son of man prophesied to us. And ministry got a hold of us and breathed the word onto us and brought us to a new perfect body. Put sinew on us. Hallelujah. And gave us a new spirit. Brought us into the third creation. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away that stony heart. I will give you. Look at what the Bible says. I will give you an heart of flesh. You know, we're not just talking about the seed of emotion here when we're saying heart. Oh, he's got a good heart. His heart for the Lord. Yeah, we're talking about that. But we're talking actually about the chemistry that makes up your physical body. Look what the Bible says. I will give you a heart of flesh. Oh, yeah, but you know, it's missing a ticket just like my daddy. Oh, no. I will even give you a heart of flesh. How many years have you read that scripture? Can we now apply it there? Would you be game enough to do that? Do you believe it fits right there? I want a new heart, don't you? Well, I, well, when the Bible said that, I will give you a heart of flesh. What was he talking about? Yes. We'll think about that. Let us be glad. Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. We're still talking about eating. Because when you eat, you bring forth something. When a man and wife get together in union, they produce a child. When the theophany come into this, this old creation, what happened in that union? Something died that something else might live. When Christ came in and married us and supped with us, we brought forth a brand new system. I love what the Bible says here. It says, the wife hath made herself. King James said, ready? I'm saying, the wife hath made herself herself. Who is it that's responsible for bringing about this change beside the ministry? You got something to do in it. You have a theophany too. There's no big eyes and little U's in the the sixth dimension. They might be at your job. They might be at your school. They might be even in churches. All kinds of orders, big fellas, little fellas and everything else. But in this there's no male nor female. No marrying and giving in marriage. Everybody is just one. But what's this marriage now? The lamb is the marriage of the lamb has come. The wife hath made herself. Okay, she's made herself ready. You know what ready means? Prepared. Previous. All ready. You know, we were all made up here. All of our body parts was laying here. Like we said in the beginning. Dry bones were already laid out here. Made herself ready. You say, oh, well, you know, she got a dress on. No. Predestinated, previously, pre-existed, everything. We were already glorified back there. The book was open to us to understand how to break through the veil into time. We got an understanding in that realm how to get here. Somebody was preaching to us on the other side to open the door, to open the gates in order for the king to come in. Is that right? Somebody was already preaching there. And when we get to hold of the cloud, somebody was ministering. When we look in the book of Revelation, there was an angel. He was sitting in the cloud like the Son of Man. He was doing a bunch of preaching. 
The Bible said he called for the fowls of the air. What kind of fowls are we dealing with here? Like I said when I was here last time, eagles, doves. Amen. He called for the fowls of heaven. One angel standing in the sun. We saw William Branham in, in, the, in the vision, blasphemous names. He was standing in the sun, reaching a second climax. Is that right? We in this hour are watching an angel standing in the sun. In Revelation 14, there were two of them, two angels. Amen. One angel said to the other angel, thrust in thy sickle. Here's a little angel commissioning a big angel, if you like. This is humanistic speaking here. <laughs> Humanistically. Uh, notable angel and ordinarily angels, William Branham said. Kind of categorized it so we get the idea. He said there was a notable angel and the rest were ordinarily angels. But look at Revelation 14. One and one little angel came out and he said to the other angel, uh, you go in right now and thrust in your sickle. And then, and then John said, and then I saw another angel in the cloud. And then he said, another one came out and said to this one, you thrust in your sickle. So these are two parts of the ministry. The first part was William Branham. Somebody else that was in that cloud, there were two of them communicating. And the one was telling him, you've got to go back there and preach them seals. You can't stay over here. You've got something to do. Then you go and thrust your sickle. Yes. You see, the, you see the, the angel man there? Amen. Telling the other angel, yes. you go thrust your sickle. And now but when that's all passed now. But then John sees another angel coming out, identifying another ministry with another sickle. In a second ride. And this little angel comes out and says, Boy, don't muck around. You get out there and preach this gospel. John said, I saw it. Here was these two angels in the cloud. Two witnesses. One saying to the other, It's your turn. This is your time. And I identified this ministry and told him, You go out there and preach it. Amen. What happened in 2003? The angel of fire. That's why I call him. Pillar of fire. Angel of the Lord. Christ himself. One angel commissioned another angel. John said, I stood back. John is a type of the elect. I stood back and watched this whole thing unfold before me. I saw one angel talking to another angel. That ministry was over in 1963. William Branham's ministry ended in 65. The angel that spoke to him was the, um, the angel man beyond the curtain of time, telling him about his commission, telling him he has to go back on the earth. Yes. Yes. That's all over now. Now we see another angel, one like the Son of Man. Yes. He comes back to that cloud again. And we see an associate ministry, an angel with him, telling him about his, about his ministry, telling him about his harvest time now. Both of them connecting together, not one struggling with the other. It's not as if that mighty angel in the cloud had the need for another voice to tell him. But some way, somewhere in the plan of God, God brings him together as a witness. Amen. Not one to promote another, as a witness to what God is doing in the earth. Anyway, I'll leave that there. In Proverbs, the Bible says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way. Amen. I'm not going to labor on this. We all understand this quite clearly. We're talking about pre-existence. Before we came by our mammy and daddy. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way, before His works of old. Before He made this old critter that I, that I was. This old moldy boy back there in 1962. This old creature this old man that came by sex program. Before his works of old, the Lord possessed me. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. What earth are we talking about? We're not just talking about this globe here. We're talking about Brother Glenn's earth. We're talking about this earth here. Before the old earth. Before I came into this thing, he possessed me. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or wherever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Proverbs 8.30, Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. What is that scripture talking about? Pre-existence. A previous civilization. Already prepared. There was preparation going on. Revelation 10 was preparation. Revelation 19, preparation. 
Where, where was it happening in the celestial realm? Where is it unfolding now? In the earth right here and now. Where was it being prepared? Well, let's just use an example. 1963, there's the mystery cloud. What was happening right there? The great catching away, the great gathering together. What was that all about? Preparation. If William Branham didn't go away, he couldn't come back. You know, Jesus said, I have to go away so I can come back. He couldn't do his work in his physical body. He had to multiply. That's right. That's right. He couldn't multiply as one. He, that one had to be planted. That one had to die. William Branham had to die just like Jesus had to die in order to come back in multiplied form. Christ had to die and come back on the day of Pentecost. He said, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. In other words, you will take my mantle. You will do what I've done. You will, you, will, you will do exactly the pattern after my life. That's what Jesus was saying. Well, I am there, you may be also. But I've got to die first. God took William Brown off the scene. He comes back again. He went away and came again. In 2002, what was the whole purpose? That where I am, there, you may be also. That's right. That you might take this mantle. You might shake this earth again. And do as I did. Amen. Look at this now. He says, Proverbs 8.31, Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. I'm talking about preparation, pre-existence here. And my delights were with the sons of men. When he prepared, that's what I'm talking about. When he, who's he? I'm not talking about Jesus from now, guys. I'm talking about your theophany. Yes. Amen. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. I wrote something here in Revelation chapter 5. A book was open. Revelation chapter 5. Watch this now. A book was opened before the foundation of the earth in preparation. So here we were before the foundation. What doing? Rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth. What were we rejoicing about? Because a book was open and a life was unfolding. We were given an understanding of where we were heading to. We were already glorified. Remember Jesus said, glorify thou me with the glory I already had before the world began. Then he comes on into the earth. So here we are now. A, a book was open. A Bible says before the foundation of the earth in preparation for the book of carnal life. Now I've got, the, I've got my own little terminology going on here. Brother Don's starting to transfer his uh, knowledge to, to me. So I'm learning this. He says, before the world began, we were the tree of life. Yes. Then we come into the tree of knowledge. When we came from that pre-existed form, mm, that's right. pressed our way into a knowledge, body of knowledge of good and evil. That's, right. that's, right. that's what I'm talking about here. Before the foundation of the earth, there was a preparation going on. A book was open. An understanding was given us. Oh, so now I'm going to go down there. You mean I've got to make my bed in hell? Yes, exactly. Oh, I got it. Though I make my bed in hell. You gonna be there? Yes, sir. Oh yeah. And when you wake when I wake up, I'm gonna be there? Oh for sure. Oh I can't wait to get there. <laughs> I can't wait. See that's what was going on really. I'm only dramatizing and trying to give you a little example of the way I'm looking at it. But there was a preparation going on before we got here. We were in control of our own destiny. Things are not out of control. Oh, I lost my job. You know, you know the wife, she's a little bit like that. Oh, the husband, he doesn't listen to me. And, oh, the kids are sideways. You, got to, oh, you know, it looks like everything's bizarre. Everything looks crazy. But don't you worry. Everything's under control. Everything is under control. Look, look, at, the, look at the engineering going on here. You don't think that these engineers... Would, would mess up like... No, look, look at the precision. The engineering was such that he brought, he brought someone over here from this country and, ma and mated that with this one here. And then they joined together to make a, a wild man. You know, like a bushman or whatever. Uh, it was being engineered from the sixth dimension before the works of old. We got out the plan and discussed it. Then it says, then, then I've got this little note here. These books were completed. So there was an understanding unfolding in heaven. Then the life broke into carnality through sex program. There was another book. Yes. Yes. A book of carnal man. Yes, right. a, 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 bo a book of a drug addict. 
a, a book of a drunkard. You say, oh man, he was such a terror. Oh no. He was a part of the mystery plan. And he was, a, he was an incubator. He was a, he was a little carrier. God used him. Yes. We don't have to be shamed about where we came from and what we did. In one sense, we might have to. But on another sense, if you look at it through the Word of God, through the eyes of the Word, Amen. this whole thing is precision. Amen. It's engineering. You were a part of it. Amen. Amen. And nothing was amiss. Do you think that Adam and Eve having a baby what, what, what was an error that the devil snuck into the garden and, you know, and then destroyed God's plan and met, oh, God didn't know what was going on? Oh my, the devil got in the garden. No, no, no. It was a master plan. Everything's all right. Nothing amiss. Amen. These books were completed and a third book was open. So Revelation 5 and Revelation 10, we're going to just go over there for now. The scripture that I'm referring to in my little note back there. Revelation 20 and verse 12, the books were opened and another book was opened. That's that perfect body I'm talking about. That's it right there. You were glorified already. Glorify thou me with the glory I had. You were glorified already. You had it. Amen? And then you came through flesh. Well, you, you didn't go nowhere. You were there all the time. The Bible says when, you, when I, when I when I'm w- wake up in hell, you're going to be there. Your theophany was there before the world. Your theophany was there in the works of old. And your theophany is still here. When we read the scripture, he says, when I wake up, you're still, I'm still here. You're still there. In other words, nothing's changed. You're still God. Amen. You're God with your pimples. Yes. You're God with your wayward children. You were God before. You were God then. You're God now. Everything's under control. It's just for us to believe it if the Word of God said it. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now here's this part I was saying. Revelation 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Adam was the first one. Abraham was another. Levi was another. John the Baptist was another. Jesus was another one. So like I said before, Brother Jerry Allen was another one. Brother Ronnie is another one. Brother Dave is another one. I saw another mighty angel come down. Every time we sit in church, that's all we see is mighty angels coming down. Amen. Preacher gets up there and says, Revelation 10, 1 Thessalonians 4, let's take it. Uh, well, let's take the Lord come down to Abraham. Everywhere we look, look what John's looking at. John is who we are. We are that scripture. I see another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun. What is the sun? We took it last time we were here. The greater light, the Bible calls it. This one that comes down has a greater light. You say you thought you had great light when you were there preparing this thing. But it was like moonlight in comparison to what you experience and know now. You thought you knew something? You didn't even know how to sing Amazing Grace. Now you're singing with tears, you're shaking and glorifying God. And these other angels hanging over the banister. They say, what are these fellas singing about Amazing Grace? That looks pretty cool. They got some fire going on there. What, what happened? It's a greater light. Moonlight is lesser light. We came from one glory. And you say, well, I didn't want to be born here in America. Well, it's greater light, son. I didn't want to be born at all. No, you've got greater light now. He said, no, this is less, less alive. This life stinks. Well, that's not what the Word says. You got the moon under your feet when you left heaven. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you came with a shining face. You say, well, me, all my tattoos, smoking marijuana, all these sort of things. How could that be great? Well, the marijuana, the marijuana ain't great. Neither is the drink. But the experience for the sake of contrast is a perfect plan of redemption. Amen. 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 So you see, see how we're applying Revelation 10? I just thought I'd drop that in. I saw another mighty angel. We're not just talking about it. Jesus. That's right. Mm. Revelation 10 two. Look at this. And he had in his hand a little book open. Now this is not the old or That's not that book of understanding as a theologian. No. That one's closed already. That's over. He had already been born a little scoundrel and a liar and a thief and a cheat. 
This little angel already dropped lower than the angels. He, he dropped lower than where he was. But you know what the Bible says? He who humbles himself shall be exalted. Yeah. That actually us being here in this humble abode called planet earth, some people call it Laodicea. You know this little abode here? It is what gives us our exaltation. Right. He who humbles himself comes down from heaven is exalted. You know William Branham said? Who knows what is up and down? You tell me which way is up. This is what he says. A little trick thing he says. He says, they say north is up. But you think about it. You, you guys think that we're upside down in New Zealand. Everyone says, oh, you know, from the place down under. Down the south, you're down under. Well, what are you thinking? That we're upside down every, all day we walk upside down? <laughs> Gravity has it that we're the right way up. Thank you. See, it's all messy when it comes to intelligence, but when it comes to the Word of God, and William Branham says, up is down and down is up. I know that sounds pretty kind of strange. But he says, up is down and down is up. The Bible says, he who humbles himself shall be exalted. I saw another mighty angel humbling himself. He pressed himself into this walk. He was exalted. He was quickened already. He came with a shiny face. The moon was under his feet. He left that old order. He's progressing forward. There's nothing amiss. There's nothing backward here. Amen. So watch this. this look at the scripture. The mighty angel came with a little book. In his hand, he had in his hand a little book open. We know what that book is. That's your life. That that celestial body dropped in to a created body. And now that book is open. You say, what about this book? What, what, what can we read in this book? You know the Bible says we're living epistles. Is that right? Read of all men? We are living epistles. So look at that little book that's open. We're not talking about a yellow book that you can get from a tape ministry, from the voice of God or something. We're not talking about a grey covered book or a red covered book. Oh, seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four. That's the book of redemption. We're talking about our very life. Yes. That theophany body come down with a little book to unfold on the earth. Amen. And this evening is another page in that book. Right. And Brother Branham said every generation brings forth another chapter. Yes. The life that we're living is the very word of God. Amen. Amen. We saw that angel come down in Revelation 10, one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea. And Revelation 13 tells us, uh, John said, oh, I saw something else. I didn't just see an angel coming out of heaven. I saw a beast. What has this revelation done for us in this third coming? Amen. We've seen a mighty angel come out of heaven and it's taught us all about the beast from the beginning to the beast at the end. Amen. Well, John saw both. John's sitting there in the congregation. He's having himself a good time. He said, oh, yeah. Uh, I, I saw a beast come out of the earth and a beast out of the sea. Then he turns around and he said, Oh, I saw an angel come down. He put one foot on the earth and he put another foot on the sea. What is happening there? The Antichrist rising up out of the earth. That old nature, that old flesh that was born by our mammy and pappy. That old beast nature that we preached about here in Satan's Trinity last time I was here. This angel that came down, my theophany, he put one foot on that old critter. Amen. One foot on the earth, one foot on the sea. That's the Antichrist. And what does the Bible say? You shall possess the enemy's gates. Amen. I was my own worst enemy. And my theophany, come and possess the enemy's gates. Amen. Triumph over the beast. The book of Daniel calls it the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the bear. Daniel said, Oh, I saw a lion, a leopard, and a bear, and a terrible beast. Well, those three are all one. When the book of Revelation tells us, John gives the same components. And he said, I saw, and he, and he puts them all together. Yes. The head of this, the face of a man. He puts all those components. It's a terrible beast. That's who man is. Body, spirit, and soul. That old cre creation. Satan's trinity. But William Bradham turns around and he says, I saw another trinity. Yes. You say, well, that's bad. Well, it's a flip side to it. I saw another trinity. It's, too, it's, a dual, it's a dual side to it. A positive and a negative. Daniel, he said, I saw a lion, leopard, and a bear. When I look, I see a bunch of people that want to rip me off. 
Let's just call them ripoffs. He called them beasts. They call them leopards and bears. We're talking about the human spirit. Carnal man always wants to get one over you. That's why he's a terrible beast. Always wants to get one over you. But my theophany has put his foot on that thing. Earth and sea where the Antichrist was rising. You put your head on somebody else, but they're not going to move too far. If I stood one on Dave, one on Brother Jerry, they're not going to go far if I put my feet on them. We have control. We destroy that old fella, and we have control over the new fella. We're living on this earth now, and we're ruling and reigning as kings in control of our domain. Amen. Amen. Let's get over here now. The Bible says in Revelation 13, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about the beast. <clears throat> all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him <clears throat> whose names are not written in the book of life. I'm going to close shortly. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now there's certain people that don't have this experience. What do they worship? They worship the beast. But there's some good news. Because there's another group of people, the Bible says, they overcome him by the blood of a new creation. Blood of the Lamb. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. What are we talking about, blood of the Lamb? What did Jesus say? Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. What kind of flesh and blood was he talking about? He didn't mean that we had to, you know, literally go down there and be, you know, carnivores or whatever. Eat, eat bodies. No, he didn't, he didn't wasn't meaning that, surely. But what did he mean? Was he playing with words? Was he messing with people's heads? Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about a new body, just like his one, Amen. that wasn't born by the sex program. Except you had this. You got no part of me. Except you eat my kind of flesh, come in my flesh, drink my blood. Except you get a new heart of flesh that isn't born through that old order. Except you do that, you shall die. That's what he was talking about. He's talking about a new body right there. A perfect body. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Amen. And the Bible says they overcome the beast by what? The blood of the lamb. How do we overcome our old beast? By the blood of this new body. That's been birthed by the spirit spoken word. Hallelujah. Revelation 12, 11, There it is there. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. We're not going to go into all that. Look what's happened here now. Celestial body has come on down. Destroy the beast, as we said when we were here last. Yes. Kill the old Antichrist. So I'm in a lake of fire. That's that theophany. We got that old nature. That pillar of fire burned him. And what for? To bring about a new building. Amen. We're still on this new body here, this perfect body. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. I just love this scripture so much. She hath killed her animalistic, perverted sex program. She has destroyed them. Amen. Those dictate, ten dictators are completely annihilated and completely obliterated. Right. What did Brother Brown say about that new creation? He said it's not the same old made over. That's right. That's right. Not the same old made over. That old creature has been destroyed. She, wisdom, hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. What is wine? It's a symbol of blood. Take this wine. Take this bread. Jesus was that wine. He gave bread and wine as a symbol as his body and blood. She has killed her beast. She has mingled her wine. She has also furnished her table. What are we doing with the wedding supper now? You say we've been raptured. Give us a supper. That's what I'm doing. You say we're raptured. Tell me about the wedding supper. That's all we've been talking about all night. I will come unto you and sup with you and you with me. Yes. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's all we've been talking about. Amen. Wedding supper. Marriage. Union of a celestial body and a terrestrial body. That's a marriage right there. Not some fancy ceremony in a Branham tabernacle so many years ago. 
It's when you dropped on in, that little angel spirit dropped in at your natural birth. Oh my, that's when the, all the excitement started. Hallelujah. But now we've, we've, we've transitioned all the way to this brand new order. And here it is here. She had sent forth her maidens. Here we are now. John 6 again. Just closing off, summarizing. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. What does it say about wisdom? She hath mingled her wine. She has slain her beasts. She has furnished her table. Furnished with what? Love, joy, peace. What other furniture do we need here? We're not talking about plush seats, stained glass windows. We're not talking about that kind of furnishings. We're talking about uh, fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, meekness. She hath furnished her, her table. Oh my. People are talking about a, a table spread 2,000 years long with all, a bunch of apples and pineapples and fruit juices, beans, lentils. No, no, no. That's not the supper we're talking about. Oh no. Revelation 19, I'm closing out in a moment. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. I saw heaven open. Isn't that what we're seeing? Yes. We're seeing heaven open. Heaven consists of the Word. Yes. Heaven is inside of us. Heaven is the sixth dimension. Jesus said, don't look for the kingdom by observation. The kingdom of heaven doesn't come. You can't see it with these eyes. Except you be born again. You can't even understand this. And that's what we're talking about tonight, new, new birth. From the old order to the new order. Amen. From the old man, kill that beast, furnish the table. Hallelujah. Do away with the old genetic disorder. And here we are living free in victory. Not having to be depressed, shoulders back, put a spring in your step. That's what the Word of God does for us. You say, well, I don't, I don't feel it, man. I've got this problem with my ankle. You know, come from my grandma. I hope, it, I hope it's gone tonight. I trust that all those complaints... That you thought you inherited. That that scripture might come to pass. It said one day each man will be counted for himself. And it will no longer be said. The sins of the fathers be visited upon the children. And tonight it will no longer be said. Amidst of us in this third coming. That we have all these complications because of my mother and father and everything else. But we will declare what the word of God said about us. We have a perfect body. A new creation. Not the old one done up. Not the old man hanging up in a closet somewhere. Hallelujah. We're in a brand new earth. Wow, I just love this message so much. Are you on a new earth? Do you have a new heaven? Amen. Oh, I'm not going uh, to go there. I, I quoted this before. The angel standing in the sun. We know who that is. Do you know who that angel standing in the sun is? You say, well, he's some floater up there somewhere. Some floater. Brother Branham says, well, who's greater? An angel in the pulpit or an angel in heaven? He's talking about an angel without flesh and blood. What is, what is greater? An angel in the pulpit or an angel without flesh and blood? In heaven, he says. He says the angel in the pulpit is greater. It's not talking about some because he's got a badge on. He knows how to talk better. It's because the, it's a greater experience to have come from lesser light to greater light. That makes him greater. So when we see an angel standing in the sun, it's, it's actually a messenger standing in a greater light. Is that what we're seeing? Are you seeing an angel standing in the sun? I trust you are. I trust you're not just seeing a pastor that you have to avoid when you've done wrong. Or a doctor who's going to patch up my family every time something I mess up. This is more than that. This is that which was spoken by the prophet John. I saw an angel standing in greater light. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly. Look at this great gathering together. This angel is influencing birds. Amen. Celestial bodies. And bringing them together in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. What kind of supper is this? That ye may eat the flesh of kings. Brother Daryl's eating the flesh of a king. Yes. Brother Joe, you're one of the fowls in that, in that mystery cloud. And I saw an angel standing in that sun, William Brownham, and a notable angel with him. Two angels standing in the sun. First and second climax. Amen. 
I saw an angel standing. What was their message? Come gather. Let's go and have some supper. Amen. Let's get on down into earth. Let's kill us a few animals. Let's get in there. And let's, let's eat the flesh of kings. Have you seen that angel standing in the sun? Yes. Are you one of those birds that's come down here and eaten the flesh of a king? Hey. And the flesh of captains and it goes on. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. This is not the coming of the Lord. This is, this is the coming of M.T. Edwardson. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I saw another mighty angel with a book open. I saw another wonder in heaven. A woman with given two great wings of an eagle. The, the angel of Revelation 10, 7. And a notable angel, two great wings, prophets. I saw a woman with two great wings of an eagle and she fled into the wilderness, the wilderness of Arizona. What did, we, what did John look and he saw? He saw he saw also a red dragon. Look what we're seeing. We know who the red dragon is. We know who the woman is. We know who the two witnesses are. We know who the two eagle wings is. We know who that birth of the child, it's the son of David being born into the earth. Is that right? Look the scripture says, and the earth helped the woman and swallowed up the flood. What flood are we talking about? Plasma. Right. We're talking about the blood system that the dragon spewed from the heart. And the earth helped the woman Amen. and swallowed up the old system. Amen. We're born again. Born again. We have been born again. We have a perfect brand new body. Amen. That body of yours looks pretty good, brother David. Oh, yeah. Perfect body. Can we say amen to that? Amen. I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Oh my, let's just skip a lot of that there. You know, these quotations, there's about three or four of them left. And then we're done. The rapture is in us now, Brother Brown says. Yes. Those he justified, he glorified. Then in heaven, today, yes. we are a glorified. Who are you going to believe, the quack preacher down the road or your prophet? We are glorified in the presence of God Amen. right now. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, but where we used to be, you know, they taught us that one day you're going to be glorified. Meanwhile, be miserable, wear a frown, drag your feet to church. Well, that's about all I got out of it. This is a drag. I can't meet brotherly kindness somewhere. You know, I, temperance, I'm falling off the cliff. You know, I try and climb the corporate ladder. Statue of a perfect man. I tried to climb that statue of a perfect man. Just like some good old corporate trying to climb the ladder to make it. Never had the goods. Always fell off the rung. When it came to patience, I was gone. Bust. <laughs> Start again. Like That's it. But see, praise God. We don't have to climb no ladder. No, sir. Because when we awake, oh, he's already there. When I make my bed in hell, you're going to be there. When I awake, you're still there. If I ascend into the heights of the heavens, you're there. Oh, my. Questions and answers? Closing. I'm always saying closing, aren't I? It's a long close. I'm sorry to do this to you. My wife just hates this when I, when I say I'm closing. She says, no, that means another half hour. Closing, closing. The preacher always says that, doesn't he? Uh, I apologize, that's all I can do. Your glorified body's right here. Is that clear enough for us? At the tabernacle now, the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is your glorified condition, which is your glorified condition, you're glorified in Christ right now. The Holy Spirit's in you. It's to charge your body. Amen. Well, oh, no, you know, it's to charge my emotion. You know, it'll do me. Just be in the Spirit, but my body, well, you know, it's nothing, man. It's just trash. No, it's not trash. It's a sacred place. Right. You are the temple of the living God. Right. You're glorified in Christ right now. The Holy Spirit's in you to charge your body, to give you new strength, 
to heal you. Look what I was saying before. This is this Tying together everything I said before about your genetics and your heartaches and all your gout and everything else that you got from your grandfather and grandmother. Here it is right here. The, your glorified body is right here to charge your body, to give you new strength, to heal you from the sickness that you've got to make you well. Amen. You know what the sickness we got was what we inherited. That's why we had to be born again. Amen. And that's what this glorified is about. To right. Charge this body. To heal it all was a sickness. Right. Hallelujah. There's that scripture in Psalms. Make my bed in hell. You're going to be there. Verse 11. He goes on to speaking. The psalmist David. If I say surely the darkness shall cover me. This is what you were thinking. In your pre-existed form. In that previous civilization. Remember prophet saying that? Yes. Seeds from a previous civilization? Yes. You watch this. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. What kind of darkness are we talking about? The clouded old life of a sex program. Even the night shall be light about me. That's right. yeah. What kind of language is that? Even the night shall be light about me. Even the darkness that I went through, I will be able to draw strength from it. It will mean something to me. It will inspire me. Even that dark life that I walked, it will be an enlightenment to me. Even in that darkness, my light will be inside that vessel. Just like the book of Gideon, when he had that earthly vessel and a light was inside that picture. And it came a time he had to crack that thing. And that light was always there. The light was always there. Amen. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. Yes. Think about that now. The night, that's where he came from, is now shining as the day. Through this light of his coming. That's right. We now understand our past. We understand the old creation. We understand the Old Testament, New Testament. And the third, the third gospel. Now we understand it. Look, even all that darkness of ages. Of the law. 4,000 years of, of law of Moses. 2,000 years of the Holy Ghost being bound. Now we look back down through that darkness. And all we can see is light. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You know what God said? I create evil. Brother Bosch, we created that evil that we were. I create evil, saith the Lord. I form darkness and I form light. Right. And here it says that both of them will be the same to me. Right. Even all your hardship, all your struggles, your family problems, right. all of that darkness, surely through this revelation, you have to be able to see a glimpse of light. Amen. Someone says, oh, I'm in a dark tunnel. I want to be that little light at the end of the tunnel for you. I want to be one of those little lights that somebody looks at that darkness of 2,000 years of darkness and looks through there and see a light shining. That all of that was for a purpose. When you wanted to blow your brains out, that was for a purpose. Thank God you never did it. Your theophany wouldn't let you. Even that, even that darkness will be light to you. Oh yeah. my. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me. In my mother's womb, in case you didn't think this had anything to do with your birth. Yes. He just drops that right in there. When we're talking about this darkness and light, and what's that got to do with the subject of a new body? Here it is right here in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I was already covered. I had an insurance cover. Amen. Wasn't the only one, brother. John the Baptist wasn't the only one. Jeremiah wasn't the only one. Each one of us. We're covered yes. in our mother's womb. Amen. And when we woke up, our theophany was right there. Amen. While we were going through hell, he was right there. Even the darkness is light to him. Yes. Well, we've got to close somewhere. Somebody's got to say amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you for being patient with me. I'm just, I'm just take, taking my time this evening. And I just trust that somebody will be helped with the words that we've spoken. Amen. You have a perfect body. And just like Abraham and Sarah, Sarah messed with that for a while. She tried to add to that. She tried to interpret it. She tried to improve on it. Oh, I know how that's going to work. Yep, this is going to work like this and like this. Oh, no. She thought, well, let's go over to Hagar. That's it. That's the plan of it. After all, this body is nothing. It cannot produce. Mm -mm. God said, Sarah shall. You, Sarah, you're the one. You're going to have body change, and you're going to bring forth a child. 
By the time Paul had finished, Paul had finished with her, Abraham and Sarah, what did Paul say in Hebrews 11? Abraham strong in faith, giving praise to God. Brother Branham said he looked down through Calvary. Paul did not record all of the evil and all of the darkness. Oh, yeah, there's Sarah. Boy, she giggled. She should have been punished. Could you imagine Paul writing all that? There goes Abraham. You know what he did wrong there, I tell you. He went into the concubine. He messed up real good. When you read Hebrews 11, Abraham was a man of faith. Sarah, she was strong, powerful. Look at the ministry of Paul, looking through the blood, seeing perfection in those, in those old forefathers. That's all he could ever see was the good. Because why? Their old book had been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. And Paul couldn't remember it. If God couldn't remember it, how can Paul remember it? In that sense of making them accountable. God doesn't hold us accountable. All that old book is gone now. William Branham said he transfers our life from the old book into the new Lamb's book. Out of the old body into the new. If this message can do that for an individual, it can do it for a local church. I believe a whole family can be born again. I'm confessing it with all my heart. My whole family's not manifested not manifesting the life of Christ, but I'm confessing this word. Amen. If you can do it for me as an individual, right. you can do it for my church, you can do it for my family. Amen. Amen. Yeah, how do you know that? Because Ezekiel was given the power of the spoken word. Yes. And he prophesied to that dead lost bunch of bones. And he brought flesh on them, gave them a new heart, took away the stony one, and gave them a new spirit. I believe that's our commission. That's our, that's our offer. That's our promise. We've been empowered with that. The Spirit's spoken word to multiply. And all of their body parts are laying out there. And we have the sixth seal within us. We have the power of fire, we have the power of fire to destroy earths. Purge earths. Obliterate them with the fire of the word. And then prepare that thing for another life to step into it. I'm talking about new birth. We have the commission under this new gospel to bring life to people. God bless you richly. Thank you very much for being patient. And I uh, always appreciate everything that comes out of this church. And I'm always thinking about you. Be grateful for your prayers. We're going through a whole lot of stuff back home. But I believe this word with all my heart. This word of God will see us through everything. Brother Don, come, please. Amen. That's good. Amen. You love the Lord. Good to uh, always good to hear, Brother Mitta. You know, I was thinking about Saint John fourteen. He said, "He said, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also." And uh, Saint John fourteen, Jesus had not yet. You remember in St. John 14, it was the same scripture. Just a few more places down, he said, Where I go, you know. And the way you know. Jesus told them that. Because they knew before the world was. Now, he had taken that memory from them. He had taken that mind from them. But he knew that theophany was laying inside them. And they knew where he was going. Well, where did Jesus go? I'll ask that question. Where did Jesus go? Anybody know where he went? So I said, oh, yeah, he flew out into heaven. He went way out there somewhere beyond the Milky Way, and, and he, uh, he took care of things out there, and then he come back. And Where did he go? Calvary. Is that where he went? He left. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Because he knew their body was not prepared. And they needed a prepared body, Brother Bob. He said, a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus' body was a prepared place for God to live in and fulfill the, the message of the day. But their body was not prepared yet because they needed to have a new creation. You can't be prepared in an old carcass, an old carnal body. And their bodies were still old carcasses, carnal And Jesus said, I'm going to go to Calvary. I'm going to spill my blood to prepare your body. Because when my blood touches you, you're going to become new creation. 
and he went to Calvary, prepared your earth body by dripping the blood upon the earth. Amen. Then he came back and moved into the prepared place. That's right. He prepared it, then came back and moved in it. That where I am, there you may be also. It's already happened. When Jesus died on Calvary, it finished it all. Your body was prepared. You have a prepared body. The theophany has just woke you up to that. That's what he did. Christ did it on Calvary. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare you an earth body that you can live in and know who you are. And he did that, Brother Reggie, when he dripped his blood and it ran down the cross and it ran off the, the crown of thorns and ran down his nose and the sweat and the blood dripped off his chin while he was hanging there on Calvary and it ran off of his hands and his feet and the slime and the sweat and everything else was running down onto the earth. It was preparing your body, your flesh body, so that he could come again on the day of Pentecost and live in it, walk in it. Talk in it. Be it. He's already prepared it. What does the new birth do? It wakes you up to that. Amen. How many's woke up? Amen. I am woke up. Amen. I have an understanding of who I am. Amen. You love him as he come and get a song ready. Heart of flesh. Brother Mitta was getting into something that I have looked at for a long time. A heart of flesh. Takes away the old genetics. I said, oh, my dad had diabetes. My mom had heart trouble. My aunts and uncles all died of strokes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have strokes. There's no way around it. I'm going to have diabetes. There's no way around it. That's what they kept telling me. Um, the doctors, they said, uh, they said, does your family have diabetes? Well, they all did. Well, you know, that's what you got to look for. I said, oh, you're wrong there. That's not what I got to look forward to. <laughs> No, no, no. I got a new birth. New creation. Those old genetics are gone. I have a brand new creation. And he told Ezekiel, he said, I will give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel called for a heart of flesh, a new heart. Not an old one, not the old carcass, not the old way, not the, not, not the one that not the one that, that, that only had so many ticks to it. Not the one that had the hole in it. Did you hear that, Sister Jennifer? Not the one that had a hole in it. I give him a new heart. Amen. Not the one that's got a murmur. Amen. Not the one that's... I give him a new heart. A new creation. You don't have to take anything from the old carcass over into the new day. Amen. Burn it all. Burn it all, he said. When you burn it all, you burn it all. Say, that's not mine anymore. You know, <laughs> it was that guy that was born by Opal and Lehman Parnell. But that's not mine because I was not born from Opal and Lehman Parnell. I had a new birth. Brother Dave and I have talked about it. He said, doctors can tell us whatever they want. You know. This body's not going anywhere, and this body's not going to do anything until I, I give it permission. <laughs> when I give it permission, then that's the way, that's the route it'll take. And I, I'm not giving it permission to be sick. I'm not giving it permission to, 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 to have all the troubles that the rest of them have. And when I start having those troubles, I start praying, I start fasting. I start staying in line. I start saying, Lord, what do I need to do? How do I need to get rid of this? Say, so you can't do that. Your body's going to be your body. Well, what, what if we'd have told Brother Bob that sitting there? You know where he'd be right now? I'd have preached his funeral. I'd have drove up to Michigan, and I'd have preached that man's funeral months ago. But somebody told him, preached it, and said, you don't have to accept that. And he believed it. And he doesn't have any of it. It's, it's not a matter of, oh, he's just making it through. He doesn't have any of it. He doesn't have the cancer. He doesn't have the problems. He doesn't have any of those things. He's a free man. Can we believe? Can we believe with all of our eyes? You say, well, Brother Parnell, Elisha 
had a double portion or Elijah had and he fell sick and died. Sure, sure, it can happen, but I don't have to accept it. Not one time do I have to accept it and say that's, that's what's going to happen to me. Not one time. I don't accept any of it. I am walking on with Christ. I am walking out of the genetics. I'm walking out of the old creation. I'm walking out of the old temple. And, and while I'm in it, it's immortal. It can't die until I tell it it can die. It can't finish. It can't breathe its last breath until Don Parnell says, I'm done with you. I'm going to leave. I'm going to get out. And you can die now. It can't die till then because it's immortal. It's glorified. It is, it is incorruptible. You cannot corrupt this body. Amen. It's an incorruptible body. I remember when I first started preaching that. Oh, I had families, whole families left this church because of that, that message. Four or five families sit, sit right back here. When I started preaching, I'm already glorified. I'm already immortal. I'm already these things. The new birth did this for me. Sister Amy, they started slipping out the doors everywhere. Oh, the church will close down. You can't preach those kind of things. Well, it didn't close down. I went on preaching it. It's went all over the world. And there is a people all over the world that recognize who they are now and that we are in the third coming. We are glorified. Christ is back in the earth. He's reigning as son of David. And we don't have to accept anything of the old way. It's a new way now. Amen. You love him? Amen. Let's all stand.